in one of their favorite places to eat. Today we're in the Tribeca section of Lower Manhattan and we're headed for a treat. We're going to one of the finest restaurants of its kind in the world, chosen by our guest. He's one of the most successful comedians of his generation and he stars in a long-running hit on NBC TV. He's Richard Belzer, the hip and smart comedian. I'm a detective. I'm not really a detective, but I play one on television. <laughs> Who portrays Detective John Munch on the highly acclaimed NBC series Homicide, Life on the Streets. Along the way, he's written a bestseller and appeared in films like Fame, Night Shift, and Scarface. And Richard Belzer's restaurant pick is here at 105 Hudson Street. It's Nobu. Nobu is the home of Los Angeles' culinary renegade, Nobu Matsuhisu. The New York Times says that no kitchen in the city puts out a more spectacular plate of raw fish than Nobu. So how did the Bells, who got thrown out of every school he ever attended because of his uncontrollable wit, end up with a lifestyle that includes living in a chateau in France? Let's find out. Bells and I headed for our corner table during Nobu's busy lunchtime service. All right, let's go now. Chopsticks up, Richard <laughs> Belzer. Thank you. How are you, Bill? I'm fine. Hey, thanks for picking. What a great restaurant. Well, this is my... I have three favorite restaurants in New York. Right. This is number one. Number two is Balthazar. And number three is Nico's on 76 and Broadway. So. Well, we couldn't have gone wrong with that, but this no. is terrific. And yeah. Look at this food. Where do you want to start? We got the, the, the Well, tuna. this came first. Should we go with the tuna caviar? Tuna tartare with caviar and right. new style sashimi and rock shrimp tempura. Very ex Hi. excellent. Play bon. We're and having magnifique. fun. Magnifique, yeah. That's what I wanted to hear. That I wanted to hear the Belzerian French accent. Oh. Well, people say that I speak French because I have a house in France, but right. I speak restaurant French. <laughs> I can order more wine, more water, more bread. I can say I'm finished and ask for the check. C'est fini maintenant. Yeah. Yeah, right, 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 right. That's right. it. Termine. We don't need it today, yeah, though. Encore de pain, you know. <laughs> I want to know how yes. the Bells, one of, in my opinion, one of the most edgy and successful comedians of your generation, right. ends up with a lifestyle that includes... Excuse the expression, a chateau in Bozelle, France. Bozul. Bozul. B O Z O U L S. B O Z. Think of Bozo and then U L S. <laughs> Bozo without you in it. Yeah. No, seriously, what drew you to. Did you feel that you had to flee the United States? Well, what was going on here? That's another subject, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, my wife visited some friends in this little village in France and just fell in love with the area and uh, was enchanted by it. And soon thereafter, Hulk Hogan attacked me on my talk show and almost killed me. I remember I that. I sued him. Yeah. He settled out of court and we used that money to put a down payment on a shack so the your, Hogan Arms. You bought <laughs> the shit. Shea Hogan. You bought a house with money from a lawsuit from yeah. a wrestler. Yeah. Good. Uh, did you recover from those injuries? No. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> well, what is life like? Again, I see you as a guy there with your five newspapers stacked up around you in the morning, your cup of coffee, kind of looking out at the gritty streets of Baltimore or uh -huh. New York. Right. How have you adjusted to the tranquil life in the French countryside? Well, I. I do read a lot of newspapers, but in France, I only get the Herald Tribune, right. and I don't have cable yet. I've been resisting getting a dish, so I don't have TV. Well, I'm going to give you some of this new style sushi. Oh, great. So you have no cable, no, so no, no news connection then. Yeah, so, and it's a remote little village. A lot of French people don't even know about it. But, and people say, what do I do there? Yeah, that, no, that was my question. Yeah. The thing is, get up in the morning, the big decision of the day is, do we go out to eat lunch, or do we go to the market and buy products and cook it? So that's the discussion over coffee and croissant in the morning. Then we have to decide, well, because in France, the way we do it is either you have a huge lunch and a light dinner, or a light lunch and a big dinner, because, yeah. you know, the you five course both. meals. And, like, just to say razor thin like you right. are. When people say the French are arrogant. I mean, if you go there, they have a two-hour lunch. No matter what walk of life you're in, you know every day you're going to get up and go and have the best lunch in the world. They so don't no wonder they have that attitude. They don't need it at their desk like yeah, we do in the right. United States. Yeah, Americans brag, I have lunch in 10 minutes at my desk. That's insanity. The French, everything shuts down in our village. Everything closes. And for two hours, you have you have your lunch, you know, and sometimes lunches go two, three, four hours. Well, and this is Belzer says his life in France is total bliss. When I go to France, I don't have access to all the media. So I'm literally able to relax there. There's no stress. There's no stress in this village. I never thought I'd find a place on earth 
that literally had no stress. But do you like not having stress? I mean, isn't that to be a comedian and to a certain extent an actor? Don't you have to have a certain tension always there? As soon as I get off the plane, when I come back from France, <laughs> bam, you know, it's it like, you again. yeah, you don't forget. It's like riding a bike, you know, you don't forget <laughs> angst or cynicism. <laughs> I so what's life like for Belzer in Baltimore, where he's been living for seven years filming his hit TV show? My guess is that it's huge fish in a little pond. It's sort of like if you call a restaurant in Baltimore, this is Belzer, I'm coming with ten people, clear out the back room, I'll be there in five minutes, goodbye. I'm afraid you're right. <laughs> Oh, we're closed, you but we're open. The you know, you they the changed laws for us in Baltimore. <laughs> like what, for example? Well, I mean, just, you know, uh, I don't want to get anybody in any trouble, but I literally can't get arrested in that town. <laughs> you know, Unless I, you arrest yourself. One time I went through a stop sign, which I shouldn't do, and I don't recommend it. This cop pulled over to me, and he got out and went, <laughs> and just waved me off. <laughs> the... The path that you chose of being a stand-up comedian can be an extremely difficult lot in life. Yeah. Was it ever really rough for you at the beginning? Oh yeah. When I, well, I, I started pretty late. I started when I was about 27. And I, before that, I was a newspaper reporter. I was a disc jockey. I was a jewelry salesman. Jewelry I Jewelry salesman, dock worker, a census taker. Census taker. Wait, like, dock worker? Yeah. You? Yeah. Well, I hanging didn't, out with the guys. I only lifted the, the forty-pound boxes. <laughs> But uh, no, I did everything, and I just kind of all my friends that I mean would say you're so funny, you should be in showbiz. My family, I got thrown out of every school I ever went to for being having uncontrollable wit. And, no, wait, and, hold it. Right. Let's put a period after that and get into. Is that? I mean, I know that that's part of like the image of Bell's, right. and I know that it's in your bio. Is it really true that you actually get thrown out of school? I was thrown out of about six or seven schools. I went, I was thrown out of public school. My parents put me in yeshiva, which is a Hebrew day school. How did you do there? I was there? thrown out of there. The rabbi said, get out, I'm finished with you, go eat bacon, pray to Minnie Pearl, I don't want, you know, <laughs> you know the, the Jews disowned me. They did? Yeah, well, kind of. Well, they threw me you, out of you know, were, Hebrew school where I went for discipline. <laughs> and they still threw you out. Yeah. Well, what was the nature of the wit? Was it, were you I an anarchist? I mean, Yeah, I guess so, a dissident. I couldn't help, I was the guy that made people shoot milk through their nose at lunch. I was the guy that did Always an attractive of, sight. Yeah, I did impressions of the teachers or... A lot of times my friends would get thrown out of class for laughing at me because I'd be on the other side of the room making weird faces or something. They'd laugh and the teacher would see them and they'd get thrown out. So I was when, just an instigator. No, when did, but when did this start, Richard? Like In the womb. <laughs> you came out? You came out cracking Yeah. Up. Really? Yeah. We're, well, you know, I, uh, when I came out of the womb, I said, there was no light in there. I couldn't read. No. <laughs> uh, for some reason, I, you know, as a child, I was just always reflexively funny. So after all these different jobs, the jewelry salesman, the census taker, dock worker, school teacher, how did you get to be a school teacher if you're thrown out of every well, school? That's a good question, and now I can tell the world. All right, let's I hear it. I faked the application for substitute in, in Connecticut at that time. I don't want to bust Connecticut, but you're from Bridgeport. Right? I'm from Bridgeport. Yeah. Um, they, when you were a substitute teacher in those days, in the '60s, you didn't have. They didn't ask for accreditation. You just filled out a form. And I just said, you know, I graduated from Northeastern or whatever. And picked they, a nice school. Yeah. And what they, was your major that you picked for uh, yourself? Phys Ed and Psychology. Phys Ed, oh, good. Uh, <laughs> and um, so, I mean, I did go to college for a couple years, right. but I never got a degree. How do you playing. stay in such excellent shape? I guess genetics. Is that it? Yeah. Well, I, do, I play basketball. I do a lot of walking and bike riding and do, yoga. Is, what do yoga. about the Bell's diet, though? You have a philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> I heard about this one. Yeah, stay, stay away from anything that's white. No, no, no white, white sugar, food. white flour, mayonnaise. Salt, white people, <laughs> anything white. If they're serving you white yeah. Next, no white food, but some sizzling entrees from the corner table with actor-comedian Richard Belzer at Nobu in New York City. The restaurant features a $1 million interior design with a wall of 50,000 black river pebbles, a copper leaf ceiling, a wood floor with stenciled cherry blossoms, and a fairy tale forest setting of birch trees. The sushi bar is one of the hottest seats in any New York restaurant. So once again, chopsticks up. Unbelievable. So you would, uh, by the way, I just just to get myself comfortable here for the yeah. next couple of right. minutes, why the sunglasses all the time? I'm curious. Well, when I was a young boy, way uh, back when, in yeah. the 50s, growing up, I was very enamored of beatniks, jazz musicians. No kidding. And I just wanted to be, you know, a beatnik or a jazz musician or somebody, you know, cool. Right. And so I would start wearing shades like in grammar school. High school. So you, so you were wearing sunglasses like this? Yeah, always. All, all the way down. I was a little boy. I like wearing sunglasses. I'm wearing 
I sometimes become suspicious of people wearing sunglasses at dinner, but I'm not suspicious of you. No, I know you. People know what to expect now. You're a man who Our spectacular enjoys. entrees included yeah. Icelandic salmon trout and squid pasta, prompting a visit from the restaurant's mastermind, Drew Naporin. Well, thanks for being a wonderful host for us today. It's my pleasure, and uh, when it's up to you know, this is one of New York's treasures. He's one of the real culinarians that we have in the Big Apple. You and Rudy Giuliani. Thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, no more. Right, right, Arigato Thank you. 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 Nice to see you, Drew. Drew Naporn, everybody, owner of the restaurant, with Robert De Niro, his partner who you never see. Right? Yeah. You don't get to see De Niro anymore. He's busy. No. Mm. This is incredible. Wow. Who thinks of these things? I have Drew. to have a moment here. Mm. Richard Belzer's happily married to actress Harley McBride, who also works on Homicide Life on the Streets. Well, we've been together on 17 years. We've been married 14 years. How'd you meet? We met on a blind date, which neither of us wanted to go on. A friend of mine who I went to high school with in Connecticut had moved to L.A., and I had moved out to L.A., and he said to me, he said, you got to meet this woman. She's the most beautiful woman in the world. And then he said to her, outside of my presence. You gotta meet this guy, he's the funniest guy in the world. So both of us saying, yeah, right, you know, like. But you really didn't want to go that night. No, but for some reason we, we met, and I'll never forget the first line. She, uh, we were introduced, and she said, so you're a comedian, are you funny? And I said, are you beautiful? <laughs> and then we were off to the races from there. How, I'm always curious when, when a blind date ends up in really going the distance. Right. right now. When did you know? When? did you know, hey, this is somebody, I'm, I'm following up on this, we've got the potential here to go the distance? It's a really good question because I, rem I remember the first time I said I love you to my, my wife, my then girlfriend. We're, we, were in her, we had been dating for a few weeks and one night we're in her house and we had a little dinner party with a couple other people and she and I were leaning down by her stereo looking for a CD or something to put on and, and I just, for some, I know it sounds corny and poetic but it's true, I got this kind of a rush, like a wave, this really great feeling and I, and I looked at her and I said, I can't believe what I'm about to say, she said, what say it says, I said, I, I love you, oh, <laughs> you know, and it was like, sweet. it was really sweet. That is and, sweet. And I mean, since, oh, well, I mean, that wait, yeah. and what happened then? Well, she was, you know, very flattered and... Right, so she said, well, I'm flattered by that. Richard, no, no, thank you she, very much. She said, I can't hear you. I didn't hear you. She made me say it again, <laughs> which I thought was kind of sweet. But uh, we've been through a lot together. I mean, I, um, we, uh, I think the secret is that, to, this may sound corny, but never stop communicating. Never, another thing I learned is don't ever go to sleep angry. Always resolve something before you go to sleep. Yeah. Don't carry it over that. There. And, and, um, and don't be shy about your needs and your feelings. I mean, for I mean, we had some rough times in the beginning. And, if, if 17 you know, years, if you don't have rough yeah, times, you know, it's the a last, cartoon. Exactly. The yeah. last few years have been, uh, I'm almost embarrassed to say, have been almost idyllic. We get along so great. The girls are grown. We have the house in France. My show's been picked up. And, you know, so it's like... We're eating at Nobu. I'm eating at Nobu. Uh, you know, I know you, people like you. And Thank you. So, I mean, I'm... I'm um, I didn't know Jews could be this happy. <laughs> Oh, wait. Something, something will happen. No, but Belzer's kind of peace and security you? today you know, is far kids. different than his early days I mean, in show course, business. Of course, you know what I mean? When I was young and I started doing stand-up and I, and I bombed, I would get really depressed. You know, it was like crushed. I remember, you know, one of the, in the first six months of the business going on to catch or the improv or something and bombing. And that it was devastating. It was like a death of a family. But eventually... Um, you know, you get good at what you do, and you don't bomb that much anymore. Let's talk about the other end, success. Yeah. Some of the people you worked with early on when you were MC at Catch a Rising right. Star. Let's pick three. Paul Reiser, right. Jay Leno, right. Jerry Seinfeld. Right. What do you remember about Paul Reiser in the early days? Um, Paul had had a style, he had a very mature style. It was like, I always, he always seemed older than he was for some reason. That was like a unique quirk that he had. He would talk like an older man for some reason. And it was very, you know, it was very disarming and charming. How about Leno? Jay Leno. Leno and I, we started in the early 70s together. He used to come in from Boston. And he, we'd heckle each other in the early days. Hey, Belson, where'd you get that beetle wig? You know, like. <laughs> and uh, Jay and I used to hang out a lot. And um, Seinfeld, I passed in the auditions. I used to run the auditions every Monday night. And like 
I had to take a number one day Jerry Seinfeld came in and I said hey you're pretty good why don't you come back tomorrow night and uh, so that was a thrill to see people like that go on it's a wonderful thing to see the, the huge amount of talent that has come out of this generation oh, and how they're charging Rich Lewis and I started together um, Jimmy Walker um, Robert, well, Robert was already established. Robert Klein. Robert Klein, who I, sure. who I saw the other night. Um, he's brilliant and funny. So I was just very lucky because um, I was treated very well by the older comedians for some reason. They, you know, like uh, David Brenner was very, very nice to me and helped me. And, and you have one Robert. comedic hero, Richard? Well, Richard Pryor is the Michael Jordan, the Babe Ruth, the Muhammad Ali. I, I don't think anyone will ever be as good as Richard Pryor in his prime, no matter how long this plant lasts. I saw Richard Pryor opening night, Mr. Kelly's in Chicago, oh, wow. 1967. Blew the place yeah. away. People were falling yeah. on the floor. By far the, the greatest. Let's take a break and have some great dessert. I don't know, I'm still working on that. Well, you finish <laughs> that. All right. we got, we got we'll fun. be right back. And I welcome you back to our corner table here at Nova with the Bells. <laughs> Richard Bells. Look at this. What a, an array of desserts. Tapioca soup. Some kind of a hot chocolate. Hot chocolate. Japanese mint. Green tea. White chocolate ice sauce. cream. And of course, I don't know whether to photograph it or eat it. Mm. Gotta try it. How was that? Mm. I think you're gonna like everything. A couple of our one dish hasn't missed. No, that everything's been excellent. Amazing. A couple of signature questions. We go back to your place. I'm busy. Right now. Excuse me. <laughs> What's in your refrigerator? Open the door and tell us. Oh, in my refrigerator. In your refrigerator right now. Well, do you really want to know? Yeah, I want to know. Um, a half a veggie burger. Who ate the other I, half? I had it last night. <laughs> right. Champagne, of course. Always, my wife always keeps champagne and white wine in the refrigerator. Right. Beer. Um, leftovers. Some what leftovers. leftover? I think some salmon, some sliced salmon, and um, there's not much because we just moved to New York, so it's kind of sparse. But the half a veggie burger, sort of like that, the light is on that. Yeah. Now, if we if we turn the clock back, Bridgeport, Connecticut, 12 year old Richard Belzer. What was the dinner table like on a typical, you know, Tuesday or Wednesday night for you? Okay, you're me. I'm my mother. <laughs> you spilled the milk. <laughs> now, actually, there was a lot of there was a lot of violence and laughter in my house. How, how many around the table? Well, me and my brother, my mother and father. Right. And um, I, I, for some reason, I was always knocking things over. And my mother thought I was doing it on purpose, but I was convinced as a child that it, it was an accident. It was like I'd reach over and knock over. In those days, the big quarts of glass the milk, milk and knock like a tidal wave. Yeah, I was just very sloppy, <laughs> big slob. What something. time did you eat dinner? Uh, six o'clock every night was like the law. Yeah, I'll give you some of this chocolate here. We could be beamed up, right, and beamed down. Anywhere in the world for dinner tonight, you and your wife. Yes. Where would you like to be having dinner? Besides, anywhere, anywhere in the world, besides your home and friends. Besides Nico's on 76 Broadway. <laughs> um, Anywhere. We every time we go to Paris, we go to La Coupole. La Coupole. You ever eat there? Yeah. Yeah, that's we love that place because it's it's, a, it's just like you know it's twice as big as this. It has the same kind of and you know it's a, it's the, something about as you know in Paris everybody looks like they're on a movie set. Everyone is well dressed. Everyone everything looks is interesting. special in Paris, right? Yeah, yeah. There's a veneer in Paris. You know, it's like you could do anything in Paris and say, oh, you did that in Paris. You're oh. like. You know, say, I went to the bathroom in Paris. You went to the bathroom in Paris? Oh, oh. we're going to say that. I read yeah. the newspaper yeah. in Paris. And yeah, everything nice. has a veneer. And I sneezed. Yeah. In you can't Paris. really go wrong. I also like Brasserie Lip. It's an old place at Hemingway and his writers used to hang out in the Cafe de Magot. And there's just, you, really, it's hard to miss in Paris. I'm going to write a book someday in search of a bad meal. In Paris. Yeah, and never find one. <laughs> well, you, we'll interview you on the Food Network when you okay. publish that. Now, let's go into the future. Yes. If we could come back to this lovely table here in this fine restaurant. Yes. In 10 years, 10 years of your life and my life and all of our lives right. has gone by. What do you want to What do you want to say about that 10 year period of your life? That there's no more homeless and hungry people in America. I mean, here we are, we live a great life. Amen. Having great food. And I think that's one of the things that um, our country really, it's not chic anymore. But there's a lot of kids that still don't get enough food and a lot of elderly people. So in 10 years, I'd like to celebrate with you in this setting that no one goes to sleep hungry in the United States. Amen. I will absolutely drink to that. It's a wonderful thought. Let's toast to that. Let's toast to that. And I would like you to offer, if you don't mind, a personal toast to our Food Network viewers. Food Network viewers obviously have the best taste in television. <laughs>